And today we're looking at the question, how to recognize your racial blindness. So not necessarily the things that um, you see that um, um, kind of aren't there because of the way that you've been conditioned, uh, but also the things that you miss in how the world works um, based on identity. So we're going to look at um, some political theory stuff, some philosophy of identity stuff, some epistemology stuff. Um, we'll get into that into a second. Um, but since we're talking about uh, bias and what you can see and what you can't see, I thought a classic way to kick off would be with a little round of spot the difference. So um, this is an activity about your racial bias uh, between these two people on screen, but this is a spot the difference uh, activity. Can people find the, I think there's 10, 10 differences between the photos on the left and on the right. And say hi if you're in the chat, if you haven't already. Real Joe, okay, Matt is saying, do you know someone called Ramesh Rage Nathan? I don't, but I do know of Ramesh Ranganathan, one of my favorite comedians, love Ramesh. My hot take on Ramesh is that he's, he's pushed himself a bit too far these last few years. He's like taken on too many projects, you know, too many BBC shows, too many like talk shows, too many, but get back to stand up, Ramesh. Anyway, if you're, if you're watching. Um, Okay, Rebecca Carmen is saying label on the wine bottle at the back. Yes, we've got label at the wine bottle. So we're talking this one. What else have we got out there? Uh, the angle of the man's tie. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We've got a difference there. What else have we got? Orange cup on, oh, Rebecca Carmen, orange cup on shelf on left. I think it's the same. Oh, but I think maybe Rebecca Carmen, what you've noticed is that here, the light is on, but here it's off, which makes the orange different. So the light is off here. Uh, the book color has changed. What other differences have we got? Um, Ms. 91, classic, point out, we've got a different apron here. Um, Remu 462, yes, painting on the wall, different colors, changing it up. Um, okay, okay, sorry if, sorry if you said it earlier and I'm only seeing it now. New Zealand Catherine, the wine glass color. Yes. We're going red, then we're going white. What else have we got? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've got three more. Uh, yes, Rebecca Carmen and anyone else who already said that and I missed it, the coffee maker has changed direction. How many got left? Yes, this cup changes. Who said that? Olive H, 2008. Thank you, Olive H. I think if we've got any more, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, it's very it's a very subtle one, this last one. I'm just gonna see if anyone's anyone's got it. I'm cycling back through. Okay. The one the one that you missed um, was that this guy's button. One of these buttons is missing on the one on the right. Subtle. Also potentially because my screen resolution is terrible. That didn't come up on your screen. Um, all right. If you're joining, this is an AMI Live, Philosophy One. I'm Nish, okay, big Nish and Chips, okay. Initial thinking, okay, initialicious. And uh, we're looking at the question of how to recognize racial bias today. And like I said to those right at the beginning, um, that's a bit misleading because we're going to talk about that, but we're also we're just talking about this idea of like um, what I'm going to call and like what other people have called epistemic blindness. And so how your identity in the world and kind of where what part of society you end up in allows you to see the world in particular ways but also makes you miss the world in particular ways in the same way that we miss this man's button. Mm. All right, okay. So the kind of topic of philosophy, or one of the main topics we're gonna be talking about today is, ooh, is epistemology. Now, does anyone wanna have a guess as to what epistemology is, what epistemology is about? Shane 100, aka Nishtha. Um, there's a long story behind Nishtha. I was supposed to write Nishtha Fish, ran out of time, just wrote Nishtha. Time split is two on the GameCube. Okay, um, and sorry, Rebecca Carmen, if the buttons didn't come up on your screen, um, but it's all part of today's lesson. It's all about me being able to see it because of the screen I have. Um, okay, anyone, anyone, okay, epistemology, if no one's heard of it, that's fine. Most people have no idea what this thing is. So it's an area of philosophy to do more or less with like the philosophy of knowledge and beliefs and like how do you. Um, know that your beliefs uh, are correct and are true and like what, is, what do those words mean when we're talking about those things we're talking about epistemology and so even when you know a, a few um a few weeks ago when we looked at 
do I live, do we live in a simulation? How do we know that we were looking at these questions of knowledge? So some of that stuff's going to come back up again today, but let's jump right in. Okay. Also, as a side note, before we jump into things, this week is building on last week's lesson. If you were already here on questions of thinking about the world in terms of systems and how that might challenge some of our kind of assumptions about how moral claims work. So I'm, we're going to do a little bit of a, um, a quick revision on what it means to see the world in terms of systems before we can get into today's lesson. So if, don't worry if you missed last week. For those who were here last week, do, those, do you guys remember um, three of the main things that make, uh, make a system work? So when we're talking about a system, we're talking about any whole where you, the best way to understand the behavior of the parts is in relationship to the, to the whole. But there were three R words that we were looking at. Okay, Olive H2008, Brett Gumbler, you said rules. Uh, yes, so one is that systems, uh, any kind of whole. So we talked about the cardiovascular system, we talked about the education system last week. Did we? No, we talked about the fashion system. Um, Olive 2008, yes, relationships. Correct. 100% relationships. So when we're talking about systems, we're talking about parts. Um, that are playing by particular rules that have particular relationships to each other. So again, we talked about um, like in a soccer team, you can't understand how like each individual player is functioning unless you understand like what are they a goalie, are they a forward? You know, they have particular um, roles. Yes, get out of the freezer, thank you. And also based on a lot of other people also that. Sorry, New Zealand, Catherine, I see you. Um, so they have particular roles, goalie. I should have chosen a better sport. I don't know anything about football, soccer. Sorry. Uh, you have particular roles, there are particular rules, and there are particular relationships between all the players uh, within the system. Okay, so before we just assume that we know exactly what that means, let's generate um, some ideas for the kinds of in, uh, what is that education system. Let's say a school system. All right, so just jump in the chat and just let me know everything that comes to mind when you think of the school system. Um, what are we talking about there? What, um, what kind of roles are there? What kind of rules are there? What kind of relationships are there? What is, what are the different parts of a school system? All right, great. NG Hall, we're going to teachers. Teachers are out there. They're teaching. Shout out to teachers. We love you. Um, like real teachers, not like live stream teachers like me. Though, that's not a sledge on other. And don't worry again. Head teachers. Um, there are head teachers out there. There we go rule over the teachers they're in the head of them um great ms 91 has come up with a rule that operates in the school system no running in the hall there we go there's a little rule what else have we got there um rebecca Cummins shouldn't support staff i don't I, I don't know if that's a rule that students no you're saying you shouldn't support staff <laughs> sorry <laughs> just because you know we, i can't hear your voice i'm just going off words I get it, student support stuff. Um, Aim High Live, and this is just the biggest legend. That'd be so funny if I just wrote that in the chat, <laughs> but it didn't, someone else wrote that for the record. Whoever it was, I love you. Um, has anyone said students? I'm gonna put that in, guys. Guys, you, you, are, you, have all, you are currently or either have been uh, students, and I just thought that the first thing people would say but I respect your like selflessness. So that wasn't the first thing that came to mind as students. What else do we need in schools? Think like physical infrastructure and stuff. I mean, I'm kind of just, that's, I've led you on there. What are, what are we talking about? We're talking about school buildings. No hats inside, I like a New Zealand Catherine. Um, there's another rule. Okay, I mean, we could just go on forever. Um, what was the one that we just said? Oh yeah, Rebecca Carmen, there we go. School building. And this is just a school system where, you know, we could, the school system it's itself, any individual school system is like a subsystem of like the education system in that region or whatever, and blah, 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 it keeps going. Education system, very complex. There's many things and keep going. Um, I mean, so one of the things I wanted to do here is like refresh our minds of what a system is um, before we start looking at the relationship between epistemology and systems. But also, um, I chose school systems because this is a system that we're very, it's just very easy for us to talk about. Like um, compared to when I asked if anyone had idea what, any ideas what epistemology was and it was uh, stone cold silence. Uh, this time we all had some input to make. 
um, because we've, we've all had experience with the school system. Um, and obviously, we, as students, we see particular parts of the school system and we're more familiar with them and they come to mind more quickly in particular rules, like no hats inside, no running in a hall that we're more familiar with, but we might be less familiar with just like very mundane teacher only rules about how to file their reports or something um, because we never had to see that part of the system. Um, and then again, if I asked you about a completely different system, or I asked you maybe about uh, the judicial system or like complex technological systems of like how your laptop works. Some of you might have really good insights into some of that stuff. Uh, you know, maybe you listened to uh, Matt's Aim High Love a few weeks back about how the government works, for instance, and you kind of figure out the different parts of the, the at least the UK government. Um, but this is just like a general like uh, acknowledgement that when it comes to systems, um, we, I think we already kind of have some intuitions that they're like some systems we know better than others. And then within some systems, we know we know particular parts of systems better than we know others because of our experience with them. Um, and I, I guess like today's big idea in some ways isn't that, isn't that complex. I think it's very powerful, but it's just taking that same logic and then figuring out how, um, how that affects people's experience, uh, in the social world that we all share. Um, so let's get into that. Um, so very quick, um, little check in on this again, what is knowledge? This question kind of central question in epistemology, which I think someone in the chat at some point described as vanilla philosophy, which is very fair. It is vanilla philosophy, but I think we should all uh, get across some of this, uh, before we get into the less vanilla stuff. So, so let's say, um, let's say that it's 1 million slots. I've chosen you because you've got such an amazing name. 1 million slots is out there. Uh, slothing about, I can't draw a sloth. I'm trying to draw a sloth right now, just from your, the images you've put in. This is me improv sloth drawing. Okay. So there's it's a sloth, or let's not call them 1 million sloths. Let's give this particular sloth a name. Um, uh, 1 million sloths, what should we call the sloth? I don't know what a sloth's body looks like. So this is just generic animal body, generic land animal body. Bob. All right, great. Thanks. Right, so Bob the sloth studying for um, his next geography exam. He's looked into all of Hannah's aim her lives, of course, and geography mastering it. Um, and then knows that there's something coming up in the test about capital cities. Finds this little um, piece of paper, which he thinks is, oh, maybe this is a cheat sheet for uh, the exam. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, I'm going to nail this. It's just a list of all the capital cities. Um, I'm going to go study this uh, and I'm going to kill it. Now, for those who haven't figured this out already, um, on this sheet, there are four countries and four capital cities, um, but three of them are wrong. Um, I mean, I'm just going to, I'm not going to assume. That, can people name which one of these is the right one? Which of these is actually the capital city of the country it's next to? Oh, real Joe is saying that I've got some serious lag. Is that still happening? Can you guys uh, hear me okay out there? This is why we're not in a real school system. Yes, great. Uh, so it's Japan. So let's say that Bob, uh, the sloth, um, yeah, studies, studies this, um, believes that the capital of the UK is Edinburgh, capital of France is Bordeaux, capital of New Zealand is studied in. It also believes that the capital of Japan is Tokyo. Now, would we want to say that, um, would we want to say that Bob knows that the capital of Japan is Tokyo? Who would say that Bob knows it? Like Bob has found this sheet. He's read it. It says that Japan is Tokyo. He believes it, um, that he, he knows that Japan is Tokyo. Who wants to say he, he, he knows this is true? And who wants to say it's something else? Okay, me is the only one we're back. Thanks, Penny. But Bojo is wrong. Okay, boys, uh, Tom17, what's that he knows? What do other people think? Who he thinks he doesn't know that um, Tokyo is the capital of Japan? All right, Mears91 has nailed it. So Mears91 has said, if his knowledge is based on the rest being true, then he doesn't know. So again, sorry if I'm lagging out there. I mean, if this becomes too terrible. We can always like just redo this at another time, but I think we might be okay. So Ms. Only one who said, if his knowledge is based on the rest being true, then he doesn't know. New Zealand Catherine says, 
he knows, but is that because he read it or from previous learning? So we want to send you something, Catherine, in this case, let's say he didn't, he didn't know before, he didn't read it anywhere, this is the first time he read it. So building on what Mises 91 said, um, there are some thinkers who want to say that Bobby doesn't know this. He, he, it's like a lucky guess. He happened to be right. But this, like this piece of paper in general is like an unreliable source. And so they think, in reflection, they said there were three things we need for something to count as knowledge. So firstly, it needs to be, it needs to be a belief that we have. So in order to, to know something, you've got to actually believe that it's true. Uh, I could probably go into more detail about that, but just uh, let's just say that for now and hope that that works for you. Okay, so uh, the other thing for something to count as knowledge is that it has to be true. Um, so you can't um, say that, like, you know, have you ever been in like, um, this is like such lazy language when you're like fighting with someone um, and, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm, f I'm frozen. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and wrap this up with the energy we have and then see, see, see if it's, if it's too bad, let me know. And then we can, we can, we can do it another time. All right. So something's going to be true to count as knowledge. And then finally, this is the big one that something has to be justified, uh, to count as knowledge. So together we say that knowledge is something that's justified true belief. And the thing about Bobby is that he can't, um, he can't trust this piece of paper. And so we don't, even though he happens to believe that uh, Tokyo is the capital of Japan and that happens to be true, so he's got a correct belief, it's not justified because he's got this unreliable source um, that he's, that he's uh, working with. Um, okay, so let's, let's take this home in our last few minutes together. I think, I think I'm back, back on the green in terms of my streaming. I'm just saying it's fixed now. Great. This is the good news I needed at this juncture. All right. So, so we've got this idea, okay, what systems are. We've got this idea of um, what knowledge is, um, which is justified true belief. Now let's put these two together and see where that lands us when it comes to kind of uh, racial identity and racial knowledge within particular um, social systems. All right. Now, this is... Um, a little thought experiment um, slash story uh, called the magical washing basket. Now, um, this is actually a skit originally by an uh, Australian comedian named Troy Keynes, I think he's, I don't know how to say his last name, but let's just call him Troy. So let's say in this story, um, Troy and his, um, his partner, um, let's give her a name, let's call her Tracy, Troy and Tracy. Um, Troy and Tracy um, are living together, they're deeply in love, it's great, um, but uh, Tracy's starting to get a bit angry about um, the amount of housework that she has to do and um, this, she's got heaps of stress from her job and she comes to Troy being like, hey, I just need, I just need a bit of help with chores you know, this week, um, can you help me out? And Troy, uh, <laughs> Troy um, it's like, hey, Tracy, Tracy, um, you need to, you need to um, just chill for a sec. I've got some really good news for you. Um, it's a secret I've been holding on to, but I think now it's time for you to know that in our house, um, there is uh, this magical washing basket. You take, Troy takes Tracy over to this basket and he says, look, this basket, if you just put all your dirty clothes in, um, you know, by the next morning, they will just be completely clean and folded it back in the basket. It's insane. And Trace is getting increasingly agitated as Troy is like describing this and he's saying, are, are you insane? He goes, no, no, actually there's more. And Troy walks Tracy over to the coffee table in the middle of their living room and says, hey, look, this is coffee table, right? It's just like the magic basket. Okay, I don't know if this is gonna work for you in the same way it works for me, but you can just leave stuff on it, like pizza boxes, like dirty plates and cutlery. And somehow by the next morning, They'll just vanish. And this skit ends with Troy and he's like talking to two police officers. Um, and they're like, I, I don't know what happened. I don't think she left me talking about Tracy and saying, um, I, I heard her move in the night. She must have slipped onto this um, magical table 
and disappeared. And then one of the police officers, uh, who's a woman, is just like, you are insane. And then the other police officer, who's a man, says, no, I think he's telling the truth. I have one of these at home. And it's a weird skit, to be honest. It's one of those weird skits where it's like toe the line. You're like, is this funny? It's just like, just like not taking the, like the division of labor in the home seriously. But I think it's actually quite useful um, for thinking about this question of epistemology and what we might call epistemic justice. So the thing is, in this story, you have Troy and Tracy, they're living in this house. Troy, it's obviously farcical. Troy believes in this magical washing basket, this magical table. But the, um, the obvious case is that Tracy is doing all this housework and Troy is completely unaware. He's blissfully unaware of how the world works. And so what we already see here is that when Troy looks at this basket and this table, he like literally sees a different world than when Tracy looks at this basket and this table. And that's kind of like semi harmless, like in the context of the skit. But I want you to imagine for a second that there's this um, um, broader imaginary world in which Troy and Tracy live and with, you know, this also these police officers who um, the male police officer who also believes lives in this world and that it's this world where in all these different relationships, every man is a Troy and every woman's a Tracy. And there are these big kind of public narratives. Um, public stories going around about how the world works uh, and like actually the the tale that everyone gets told when they're growing up uh, is the story of the magical washing basket and the magical washing table like that's just how the world works um, now that was uh, now that sounds crazy in the context of I mean, of of, um, of the story like it's obviously like that that Troys wouldn't be that stupid. The Troys would eventually figure out what was going on, you would think. But one of the insights of systems thinking is that because within systems, we all occupy different spaces in a system, in any social system. Again, whether you're in a sports team or whether you're in a classroom or whether you're in a society which has particular narratives about particular races or particular genders or people with, um, yeah, who look, look a particular way from a particular country, all that stuff. These narratives um, come to shape the way all of us see the world. And um, as you know, the reason why we're talking about some of the systems thinking stuff at this particular um, juncture is, of course, the murder of George Floyd and the kind of protests that have followed around the world, this kind of global moment of reflecting on um, like anti-black racism. And I think this is a real opportunity for all of us. And I know like some of you guys might be in high school, this is the first time you're really thinking about some of this stuff, is that um, in the social systems we live in, um, it's not always clear. Like someone asked, uh, get out of the freezer, I think, they said, in this world, are you either a Troy or a Tracy? There's no in between. That's a great question. So obviously in the thought experiment, it's like there are Troys and there are Tracys. In the real world, we all you know, have certain experiences which um, allow us to see the world more clearly, but also we, are, we miss out on other experiences so we can we miss out on like seeing how the world works. Um, but the, the big idea uh, today, which is actually from someone we're going to skip to, we'll come back to him, but his name is W.E.B. Du Bois. See his name on screen, Du Bois, um, who's an African-American philosopher uh, writing in the kind of the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, he talked about the fact that when you grow up in this kind of world, so sub out um, like a Troy and a Tracy for maybe like uh, a black person and a non-black person. And there are particular narratives about um, uh, black people. Um, and, you know, people say things like, you know, we got rid of, um, you know, state-based racial discrimination in the 60s and we enforced these laws that you couldn't, you could no longer carry out these crimes. There was, you know, we got rid of lynching. None of that stuff ever happens anymore. That's like the, the big narrative that everyone believes. But if uh, you're a black person, um, your experience of the social system that you're a part of gives you these insights into how the world works. Um, again, this comes to from another idea in philosophy from Hegel. He called it, um, and I don't have enough time to do justice to this today. He called this the slave master dialectic. And the idea was simply that when you've got a world in which um, there's a slave and a master in a particular household or a village or whatever, the the slave needs to understand how the master's world works to understand all its rules and the roles and relationships and like, like the way that the master sees the, sees the world. But the slave also needs to understand their own world and how it works. 
Um, whereas the master is happy to just in, enjoy the master's world and doesn't have to l learn about the kind of dirty work that goes on behind the scenes to kind of uh, get his food on his table and get his clean, his clothes cleaned and get society functioning. There's all this like background stuff. But what that leads to, and this is where we'll close uh, today, what that leads to, which W.E. Du Bois talked about, is that that means that the slaves, the, the people who are uh, the oppressed group in any given society, end up seeing the world more clearly and end up developing what Du Bois called the double consciousness. So they have both the, the consciousness and the kind of narratives that are public and like everyone's like, oh, you know, we got rid of those problems in the 20th century, everything's fine. But they also have like their day-to-day -day experience of the social problem that they're facing. And so, you know, Du Bois talking about the, the black experience in America, um, talks about having two souls, having like two minds in one, and there's two sets of eyes, and these things always being in friction, but that friction allowing you to see the world more truly. Now, again, there's so much more to this, and I'm gonna um, jump in the chat and and leave more of this behind, but I think, uh, sorry, give you some like reading stuff uh, that you can follow up on. But where I want to land this is just to say, um, sometimes we can think we have justified true beliefs about how the world works, because um, those beliefs kind of work for us in the same way that like, you know, Bob the Sloth thought that um, Tokyo was in Japan, that kind of worked that one time. But um, in any given society where there are different social groups and some people have control over the kind of master narratives and other people don't have control over those things. Um, there's going to be heaps of things we're missing. And I think this particular moment in history is a time where black people around the world are drawing our attention to the ways that the master narrative is wrong based on their lived experience of the systems that they live in. And it's really important for us to pay attention to them and kind of bring humility and open-mindedness and also curiosity um, to figure out um, to figure out how the world works. And you don't even need to be like this, like this, you can have, you can, even if your, your literal only motivation is that you want, you're someone who's hungry about truth, you, you need to do this. But also if you're like hungry for justice and a more fair world, fair world this is gonna be a part of uh, bringing that together. All right, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for joining this Aim High Live. Um, I, um, I will jump in the chat Give, give, give some more like um, reading notes for those who are keen. But otherwise, please jump back on uh, to Aim High Live at 2 p.m. We've got Josh coming back. He's doing some stuff on hormones and nerves. And then at 3.30 p.m. in UK time, we're going to have Jane Goodall doing uh, uh, an inspiring guest session. I've, it's going to be very cool. We're very honored to have her. So please come back. Uh, for both of those, um, but make sure you don't miss Jane in particular because we're very uh, lucky to have her. So um, thanks everyone. Uh, I'll jump in the chat, leave you some cool stuff to read, uh, but otherwise have a great day. Stay safe and uh, see you next time.